Now we're going to talk about Newton's laws of motion. All right, we'll start off with Newton's first law of motion. This is also called the law of inertia. And the concept of inertia is very simple. It's the tendency of all objects to resist any change in motion. So unless a force acts on an object, it does not want to change its motion. So once again, inertia uh, doesn't want to change motion. So if it's moving at a certain speed, then it wants to stay at that speed unless a force acts upon it. Uh, and generally when something's in motion, we know the force acting upon it, uh, opposing that motion is friction. Um, and also if an object is still, then it does not want to move and it's going to sit there unless a force acts on it. That is the first law of motion, that is the law of inertia. See, he's still, he doesn't want to go anywhere. And he's trying to fight the inertia of this car. The car wants to stay still. He's acting on it with a force, but will that force be enough to change its motion? All right, so let's talk about the first law of motion. Once that golf ball is in the air, it wants to stay moving at the same speed unless a force acts on it. And that force, of course, two forces, gravity, is going to pull that ball down once it's in the air, right? And then the fluid friction of the air, that air resistance, is going to slow it down. Without those two forces, if we hit that ball, we applied a force to it, it would keep going forever. Now, once the ball's sitting there on the tee, unless you apply an unbalanced force, it would sit on that tee forever and never move. But here we're going to apply an unbalanced force. We're going to hit it with the golf club. So, like I said, if the law of inertia was true, then why do we see things slow down even without the outside force, a visible outside force? Well, once again, it's forces that we can't see. Gravity is a force we can't see. And friction is a force we can't see, but those forces are always acting on things on the planet Earth. So that's why objects don't stay in motion forever, because there's always a force acting on them. Right, because we're on Earth. Always friction, always gravity. So uh, if we were on the moon, there would be no fluid friction, there would be no air resistance, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There's no air up there. So that is one of the reasons why uh, the astronauts can travel so far with one jump, lower gravity, and that lack of fluid friction. So here we go. This is why Newton's first law is important. Right? And this is why we wear our seatbelts for traveling in that car. Right? We and the car are going at the same speed, 80 kilometers per hour, pretty fast. But when that car hits that brick wall, the car itself stops. But we're not attached to that car without our seatbelt, so we continue to move very unfortunate. That's why we need to know Newton's first law. Newton's first law states object in motion want to stay in motion unless a force is acted upon them and objects at rest want to stay at rest unless an uh, uh, unbalanced force acts upon them. Don't be that object in motion without a force. Use that seat belt. That force will keep you safe. Newton's second law. How fast an object accelerates uh, depends on the mass of that object and the amount of force that's applied. We write this as a simple equation. Force, the force that is act used, equals the mass times the acceleration. And you can manipulate that in many ways. And we will do that in class. Force equals mass times acceleration. This is how we often remember Newton's second law. F equals ma. The acceleration of an object depends on the force and the mass. So, mass is in kilograms, acceleration is in meters per second squared, and the unit of force, of course, is the newton. One newton, once again, is equal to the force required to accelerate one kilogram of mass, one meter per second squared. All right, so here is an example of Newton's second law in action. Force equals mass times acceleration. So how much force is needed to accelerate a 1,400-kilogram car 
2 meters per second squared. So we solve this like we solve any formula. Write down the formula. Fill in what we know. We know that the mass is 1,400 kilograms. We know that the acceleration we want is 2 meters per second squared, and that we solve it. So we're going to do some multiplication. So the amount of force is going to be 2,800 kilograms meters per second squared, uh, and which kilograms meters per second squared is the force of a Newton. So it's 2,800 Newtons worth of force that we need. Very easy to solve this equation. Uh, it also tells us a little something about, uh, we talked about falling objects last week. It helps us to understand that although objects do fall with the same acceleration due to gravity, they don't hit the ground with the same force. Okay, just because they're accelerating at the same rate, uh, something with more mass obviously is going to have more force. And we can see that by solving the equation. Acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. Right, we know that because we can manipulate that equation. F equals ma. If you solve it for acceleration, that's what you get. Acceleration equals force divided by mass. You have your force. You have your acceleration due to gravity. You solve, and you see this larger object is going to hit the ground with a greater force, even though they have been accelerated with the same acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. And Newton's third law, perhaps the most widely known of Newton's laws, uh, when one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. You may have heard this as for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That is Newton's third law. Okay, so when objects A and B interact with each other, they exert equal forces on each other. So when you sit on a chair, that chair has to exert an upward force on your body to keep it from falling down because you are exerting a force on that chair. At 9.8 meters per second squared, you are being accelerated or a force is being applied to you towards the earth. Uh, therefore, that chair must exert an equal and opposite force to keep you from falling down. So it has to be strong enough to be able to exert that force. Sturdy enough to exert that force. Equal and opposite forces. They're interacting forces. You have the action, that's you being pulled down. And you have the reaction, that's the chair having to push back against you. Often when we are, when this is considered with the earth, when you are being pushed back on by the earth, we call that the normal force. That normal force is what keeps you from kind of falling into the earth. In nature, we see Newton's third law being exemplified multiple places. Okay, as fish swim, or as anything swims, you apply a force to the water around you and uh, then the water applies an equal and opposite force back onto you propelling you forward works for fish works for humans same thing for birds you see a bird in flight the birds wings push down on the air and thereby the air applies an equal and opposite force back to the bird's wings, giving the bird lift, causing the bird to move up and move forward depending on the direction of the force that the bird applies. Equal and opposite. The bird pushes down on the air, the air pushes back on the bird, causing it to move forward. So that force must be equal, equal and opposite. The wing pushes down, the air pushes up, giving the bird lift. And if the, the bird pushes back on the air at the same time, then the air will push forward or apply a forward force to the bird. Action-reaction forces, it's a pair, paired forces. That is Newton's third law. Also, when you use a baseball bat, uh, when you hit the baseball, the 
bat that you are operating applies a force to the baseball. And then the baseball applies that equal and opposite force back on the bat, but the bat is obviously more massive, thereby the baseball loses and it is accelerated away from the bat. Same thing in a car. Your wheels, as you think about the way your wheels turn, uh, they're kind of pushing backwards on the road, yet the car is propelled forwards because of that equal and opposite force. Same thing with rockets taking off. All the fire and gas is pushed out the, the back of the rocket and then an equal opposite force is applied to the rocket causing it to move up and out into space. This helps us with a concept called momentum. Um, momentum is another concept directly related to mass and velocity. So velocity obviously being the speed something is going. Um, when we talk about momentum we refer to momentum as P because obviously momentum can't be M because M is mass. And here's another formula to remember. Momentum or P is equal to the mass of an object times its velocity. The momentum is the kind of force that something carries with it because of its motion and because of its mass. All things have mass. Uh, if that thing is in motion with that mass, then it carries with it momentum. It's, it's kind of like the force that an object has because of its mass and its velocity. And so that momentum, because it's a force, it can be transferred to other things. Uh, and because it is in nature, and it's a force, it's a concept that is conserved. Momentum is conserved. Conservation of momentum. You don't lose momentum, you transfer momentum. So when you have objects that interact, when they collide, then you can transfer that momentum from one object to the other depending on the momentum of the objects that are interacting. Momentum. Mass times velocity. You have momentum. It's kind of a force that you carry with you because of your mass and your velocity. You see this a lot in football. Tackles, things like that. It's all about the momentum. The more momentum, the harder you hit, right? It's a force. So here we go. Let's talk about two moving objects and momentum. You got two boxcars on a railway. They're going to interact with each other. Okay, the total amount of momentum is the same. Uh, therefore, once they come into contact, the momentum changes. So here you got the red car. It's moving at 10 meters per second. It interacts with the blue car, moving at only 5 meters per second, and it transfers some of its momentum because it's moving faster. It transfers some of its momentum to the blue car and makes the blue car move faster, but if it transferred some, then it loses some, so it's moving slower. Transfer of momentum. Here we go. When you, you can do the same thing. When you have an object that's not moving, you can see the blue car here is not moving at all. The red car is still moving at 10 meters per second. It strikes the blue car. There's a, a, an interaction, a collision, and the blue car has the momentum transferred to it from the red car. The red car stops. The blue car travels on at 10 meters per second. The momentum, the force, the speed is transferred here to, from red car to blue car. And here we go. If the objects continue to move together, you can also take all that momentum and move it. Some of it's transferred, not all of it's transferred. So the red car hits the blue car. The blue car was not moving, the red car was at 10 meters per second. It transfers some of that momentum to the blue car, uh, and but not all of it. So they both move off at 5 meters per second. What's important here is you notice through all of these examples, the amount of momentum has stayed the same. The amount has stayed the same. Some of it's transferred or all of it's transferred, uh, but in, in, in all, the total momentum stays the same. And there you go, there's Newton's three laws, and there is momentum. Very important. You need to think of a way in which you experience Newton's three laws in your life so you can apply that concept to what you experience. Uh, inertia, force equals mass times acceleration, and equal and opposite 
reactions.